you know, if, if all of these things are happening, right. I mean, we have all of these, these injustices that are occurring daily, constantly, you know, uh, people will say, well, your voice can be heard because we have elections. We can go and vote. We can go and participate in this democratic process, whether it's every two or four years, we can go and we can make our voices heard. Um, and something you point to in your special and, and you've pointed to numerous times on your, your show, which is, you know, even that has been bungled or has been corrupted in, in many ways in, in more ways than I think we're even comfortable admitting, because again, we like to believe that yes, we have a voice and we can vote and we have a democracy, but you, you state very explicitly, which is absolutely true. It's a very, I think it's a fact at this point that we're in an oligarchy. This isn't a de- democratic society any longer. Um, you go yeah, on all uh, these different tangents regarding voting and, and I, I, I don't know it, in the time that we have, but if you could just kind of get into why that's kind of, not true anymore that voting really does the things that we think it does. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at, yeah. So in terms of the oligarchy, a large Princeton study tested uh, 1,779 policy issues and found that the only time our government does something that the American people want is when it aligns with corporate interests. And I have challenged people for the past several months to name the last time our government like our, our, you know, Congress and everything passed a bill that was something the American people wanted that did not align with corporate interests. And it's almost, you, you almost can't find one, not in the past few decades. I mean, it's really tough or it's something small, maybe the naming of a post office or something. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, we are, yeah, so we are an oligarchy. And then, you know, yeah, if you don't think, if you think our election system is, our voting system is legitimate, then you apparently haven't heard of uh, gerrymandering, push polling, dark money, uh, you know, the black box machines, uh, exit polling completely corrupted. Um, you know, you just you just go down the list of the voter suppression, the the po- closing polling places in certain areas, the amount of money that floods in and manipulates things, the the affidavit ballots, the the uh, the you know that really should be called placebo ballots because they never really get counted. Like it, it's just on every level, it has been corrupted, and the the fact we live on, I mean, we vote on a. Uh, black box machine that you can never see the code of because it's corporate proprietary code is so utterly laughable. It's disgusting. Almost no other country does it at the level we do in terms of just a completely dark void of you will never know whether your vote is counted. And, you know, at various times you can even prove that this stuff is going on and still it doesn't change. I mean, in uh, you know, Tim Canova ran against Debbie Wasserman Schultz in Florida, and the last time he lost, he was able to get a court uh, you know, affidavit or whatever that uh, under oath, the board, the head of the Board of Elections admitted she had had all the paper ballots destroyed after the election, which is illegal. Those are that you know, it's against federal law to destroy ballots that soon after the election. And she admitted she had signed the form to do it. And guess what? Now it's been two years since that happened. And Tim Canova ran against Debbie Wasserman Schultz again. You know who's running the board of elections? Same woman, Brenda <laughs> Snipes. Nothing's changed. <laughs> like It's so incredible that this stuff doesn't change after, after you prove the corruption and the level of, of wrongdoing um, you know, and the suppression in New York City in court. Uh, the, the the New York City Board of Elections had to uh, had to admit that they had purged over 200,000, 200,000 voters in like Brooklyn and Manhattan, mainly Bernie voters a- in the primaries. And they admitted that. And guess what's changed? Basically nothing. Two people, you know, resigned or something. But the process is not really any different. And it just keeps going on. And so my point in the comedy special, my point whenever I'm talking about it, is not don't vote, because I think corporate America would love nothing more than for people to stop voting. It's simply that we have to vote in such crazy numbers that you swamp what's stolen, you beat what's stolen. And the other thing is to not look at voting as that's the way to change the world. Voting is like, um, as Eleanor Goldfield says, it's like turning your blinker on when you're changing lanes on the highway. It's something you do, and it can, you know, it can be helpful at times, but it's not that big a deal. Like if you're trying to 
really change this world, you need to do far more than vote. Yeah, there seems to be this, I just remember this last midterm, there was so much, it was like, you know, the, the framing was like, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. They say this every, I feel like every, this, every, every election, yeah, every election, it's the same thing. And, and I'm just so fucking, I'm so tired of it. Like it feels, it's it's upsetting only because people keep on believing that, you know, because I, and I think people are desperate to have their voices heard and, and, and I understand the sentiment and I understand that there's, there's changes that can come with voting that may help certain marginalized groups in a certain ways. I, I, I understand there are some changes that can happen with voting, but to pretend like it's this great moral act or something, it just, it, it sort of. It, well, and if you're, and if you're talking about the two parties, the two party yeah, system, yeah. Uh, the number of things that they disagree on are actually, even though they're highlighted, you know, like DACA, for instance, or something like that, they're highlighted, but they're actually a small amount of the policies in this country. They're a tiny percentage that is viscerally argued over to make you think these parties are night and day. Um, you know, I, I, I think a good example, a good recent example is Kavanaugh. Now, he also had, you know, the, uh, sexual allegations against him, but put those aside. They, they, they made him out to be the devil. And he, you know, who knows, he maybe is the devil. But um, they, they acted like this is night and day, right? Kavanaugh is the, the evil judge that's put on the Supreme Court if we have Republicans in power. And if Democrats have been in power, we would have had a noble and just judge put on the Supreme Court. Well, who was the judge that Obama had put up for that position um, uh, or, or the other position uh, before he left office? Merrick Garland, all right, Merrick Garland. And so Merrick Garland did not get in because, you know, remember the Republicans wouldn't let a vote happen. Yeah. So Kavanaugh and Merrick Garland were on the, sat on the bench together for several years, the federal bench, and you know how much they voted together? 93% of the time. 93% of the time, the Democratic pick for the Supreme Court and the Republican pick for the Supreme Court vote the same. Because they're both like basically cor- pro corporate American candidates uh, for Supreme Court. So basically, that, and to me, that sums it up. When you're arguing between Democrat and Republican, you're arguing about the 7% that's left over that they actually disagree on issues. <laughs>